So today, we're going to talk about uh, God's plan for success. We're going to talk about God's plan for success in our life. And we're in Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 6, where Jesus calms a storm. How many of you ever had a storm in your life? Anybody have something come against you that was like move, winds were blowing and figuratively in your life and uh, maybe it was a relational storm or financial storm or some type of just chaos in your life? Um, I think that today we have some good words of advice about how to find success and what God's plan is for us. So here we jump in, Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, and he dismissed the crowd. Now, this is right after the story in which Jesus had fed 5,000 people. Have you, have you heard that story? Jesus fed 5,000 men and uh, women and children in addition to that with, with two fish and, and five loaves of bread. I'm sorry, five fish, two loaves. I got to go read that story. I don't know why it's getting mixed up in my mind. But he had just fed 5,000 people with a sack lunch of a young boy in, in the crowd. A miracle. And then Jesus tells his disciples, go, go to the other side and I'll meet you there. And he left them and he went up to the mountainside to pray. Now listen to what happens. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before, he went, before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. Now, Mark casually mentions that. <laughs> he casually mentions that Jesus is walking on the water out across the lake. He was about to pass them by. Now, that's an interesting phrase, and we'll cover that in a minute. He was walking on the waters. He's about to pass them by. But when they saw him on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. And then they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage and don't be afraid. I want that to sink into your heart and spirit this morning. Troubled times, challenges in your life, the things that you might face are challenging. Would you just say that out loud with me? Say, take courage. Come on, let your soul hear it. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and he said, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves or the bread for their hearts were hardened. Heavenly Father, today I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and that you would illuminate things that might be uh, either hindrances to us. We might have hard hearts at times, like the disciples. Maybe we don't see or understand the circumstances we're in. Or maybe we're just lost and we need your guidance. Today, give us your peace, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I don't know if you've ever felt stuck before. But the disciples in the story here were, were traveling in the boat, and they were just crossing over the river to the other side. And they found themselves unable to make any progress. They were completely stuck. So this is a storm that had moved in, but it's not the same storm where Jesus was asleep in the boat. There was that, that time the waves were so high they thought they were going to die. This storm was just the winds were blowing so heavily in their face that they could not make any progress. It was a storm in which the, the boat, I'm sure, was rocking, but they were straining at the oar, the Bible says, trying to move forward. Have you ever felt stuck like that? Have you ever felt like you were trying to make progress, but you're, no matter how hard you're walking or moving or, or rowing or striving or straining, the wind is just keeping you at a standstill? Maybe it's in time of transition, like the graduates, and they're, they're not sure what's go, where they're going next or uh, maybe you've had a transition in career, or maybe there's a relationship we're in where you just feel like you're hitting a wall, you know, that the wind blows hard enough, and it feels like a brick wall when you're trying to move against it. But that's what the disciples were experiencing here. They, they were in this spot in Mark chapter 6, and they're just, in their minds, they're just going to the other side. Jesus had sent them. He's like, go meet me over there. And so this is not a new experience for them to be on the water. Many of them were fishermen. This wasn't a new experience to even have a storm. They had probably seen many storms come and go. But in this particular moment, their experience, their skill at, at, at boating and, and, and knowing how to navigate the waters, and even their effort, all of their strength rowing, was to no avail. They were making no progress. They, they, were, they were stuck. And I want you to know this morning, sometimes you may face turbulent times in your life where you feel like you're not getting anywhere. In fact, you take one step forward and there's two steps back. You ever had hope for your marriage and you're like, this is, this is our year, this is our month, things are turning around. 
Have you ever had hope for a, for, for a relationship where your, your family member, an aunt or an uncle or your mom or dad, where you're thinking, okay, the, the relationship's going to get better, and then all of a sudden it's two steps backward? Anybody been there before? There's moments in our life where we just can feel stuck. It might be an obstacle. It could be a circumstance. It could be a boss in your life and your, your career. It could be an unexpected turn and events and, and, and a change in your situation. That's where the disciples found themselves. They, in their mind, were just going across. And here's, here's one of the lessons they learned uh, from the storm. It was a reminder to them that sometimes in life, even though you hold the rudder, you don't control the winds and the waves. In other words, you might think you have it all together. You might think you have a plan. You might think you know in a direction. But here's what I want to say to you today. And if you don't hear anything else, hear this. We need God in our lives. We might think we can steer. We might think we have the knowledge and the experience. We might think we can get there on our own. But listen, no matter how much you can control, there's infinitely more that you cannot control. There are things that are bigger than your life or your ability or your experience or your knowledge. And here's the thing. I'm going to tell the college students, the, gradu the graduates who are going off to college this, this next semester in second service, I'm going to tell them this. You can't put God in your backpack. You can prepare for your future. You can take all the necessary things to get yourself to where you want to go. But God's not something you just add on like a feature or a, an extra, uh, an add-on to, to your contract. Or, or you can't put God in your pocket and say, you're with me. So if I get in trouble, I'll pull you out and I'll ask, hey, can you help me, God? How many times do we get in situations where we cry out to God and God's like, I've been waiting for you to call out to me. We're thinking we can just pull him out and go, here, I need you now. Are you there for me? I want you to understand something. If you want to be a success in life, in the truest terms and senses of the word, our lives need to line up with God, not the other way around. Come on, someone say amen. I'll preach faster. Sometimes we treat God like we, we can handle life until we get to that hard moment and then we call out to him. But I want to reiterate what I said a moment ago, the, the, the heart of today's sermon. We need God in our lives all the time. We need him to be with us. We need to, to line our hearts up with his plans and his goals. And his, did you know Proverbs 19 says that many are the plans of a man's heart, but only the purposes of God will prevail. You know what that means in the end? You, you might have highs, you might have lows, you might succeed at some things, you might fail at some things, but in the end, God's purposes are the one that's going to prevail. Where we land on is up to us. Are we going to be a part of God's plan and follow him? Or are we going to say, I'm going to do it on my own and face whatever he decides? I think there's a few things we can learn from the disciples today. And I'm going to try to be brief, but I have a couple points. Three of them I think that we need to let our hearts sink in. That maybe the disciples learned, or at least we can learn from looking at the disciples when we were in the middle of the lake. Are you ready for them? Three things. If you're writing down, taking notes, put it on your mind. The first one is this. In life, we need to look for, we need to find, we need to follow God's agenda. Did you know God has an agenda? Do you know he has a plan? Do you know he has a will and a purpose? And some people think that God's will is, is going to happen in every scenario. We say, if it happened, how many of you have heard this before? If it happened, it must have been God's will. Have any of you heard that before? Come on, give me a nod or raise your hand or something. Let me know you've heard. If it happened, well, it just must have been God's will. Listen, I want you to know the Bible tells us to pray, let your will be done. Because God's given us free will. Not every bad thing that happens, not every choice we make was God's will. Now, will his purposes prevail in the end? Regardless of our choice, they absolutely will. But God has a plan. How many of you know that it's God's will that no one would perish? How many of you know that there's people who turn away from God, they reject God, they don't want him. And so his will is that they would come to him and repent, and yet they don't because they're following what? Not God's will, they're following their own will. They're following their own agenda. Did you know God had an agenda? He has a plan, he has a schedule, he has a timing in your life, he has processes that work and steps that he wants it to follow. And in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus and the disciples, they were actually going, before they got into the storm, they were actually going away to get some rest. How many of you love vacation? How many of you work hard? Let me see that. How many of you work hard? How many of you love vacation? The disciples had been busy with Jesus. 
And so Jesus actually told them, the crowds were getting so big, he said, come on, let's cross over and let's go get some rest. And so the disciples were like, yes, it's time for some R&R. Let's get some relaxation. And so the agenda that had been set, listen, it was set by the master. They were following Jesus. He said, let's go get some rest. And everybody said, amen. They're like, yes, let's do this. And when they get to the other side, they, they had been healing sick. They had seen crowds. Jesus was teaching. They were worn out from the crowds. And they were ready for this. And as soon as they get to the other side, do you know what happened? The crowds that were being taught ran around and met them on the other side. How many of you know the last person you want to see on vacation is your boss or your friends that you're getting away from, right? Or your children. How many of you take vacation to get away from your children? I don't have young people here, do I? Their, their agenda was rest. They weren't looking forward to people. The disciples didn't want anything to do with these crowds. Jesus had said it. It's time for a break. It's summer vacation, Marsha. You don't have to deal with any children unless you have summer school. Maybe you do. I'm, I'm free. We don't have to deal with these crowds. I don't know if it was for a day or for a few days. I don't know. But listen, their agenda was rest and relaxation. Mark 6, Jesus told them, come, let's go find a quiet place to rest. They went by themselves to a solitary place that many who were leaving recognized, and they ran on foot from all the towns, and they gathered and met ahead of them. Have you ever had plans interrupted? I remember that when I, my, my little children, when Micah and Mia and Jason were little, I remember particularly Mia and, uh, and Jason, you had to tell them things like in advance, and you had to, for Jason, you had to tell him, okay, we're either going to do this or this or this. Like he had to have options because if your plans were this and you decided to like switch the order of them, Jason, it just messed him up. He couldn't deal with that. He's like, no, I, his brain would like smoke would come out of his ears. He just, it didn't, does not compute, dad, does not compute. Even as a little three and four year old, he just would like, no, we got to go do this, dad. And Mia, Mia's my sweetheart. If you know her, she's the sweet young lady. But she would look at us and if we told her we were going to go somewhere and we had to run an errand first, she would look at us and say, Daddy, you lied to me. I'm like, my heart is crushed. And she's like, you lied. I go, baby, I didn't lie. We have to go do something else first. And we're going to have to go there later. But you lied, Daddy. She did not like plans interrupted. Sometimes I think that, um, that, that you're the generation before us, Pastor Oscar, we're the Gen Xers. I think our parents, our parents, you guys, if you're boomers in here, you guys were savage. You were like, some ways you were look like better parents than us. Because I was like, oh, Mia, no, daddy didn't lie to you. Uh, my wife, Chantel, her uncle Larry, he used to gather the kids in the car, and they would go run errands. And when they would pass the ice cream shop, he would say, hey, kids, want some ice cream? And he'd pull over into the, into the parking lot, and he goes, ice cream sounds good, doesn't it? You guys want ice cream? Yeah, the roars and the cheers. And he would go, no, not today. He would back up, pull out, and head right on down the street. How many of you know that's savage right there? That's like, that's, that's parenting, right, Steve? That's how you parent young people. Nobody likes their plans to be interrupted. Nobody wants the, for you to say, we're going to go do this, and your mind is set, but then all of a sudden things come and they veer over. And listen, the plans, Jesus' plans were interrupted. Jesus told the disciples, hey, let's go get some rest together. But then the crowds were there, and there's this interruption. Can I propose to you a divine interruption moment that Jesus recognized that the disciples could not? All the disciples saw was the interruption, but Jesus saw the crowds. And listen, Jesus was tired too. Jesus was fully human. You have to know his body wore out just like you and I. He gets exhausted of people. He gets exhausted of constantly giving out. So when he's going over to get some rest, he told his disciples, let's go do this. But listen, when the middle of his interruption, in the middle of this this moment where his plans were, were changed, Jesus modeled how to discern and submit to God's greater agenda. How many of you know that God's plan prevails? I mean, it's better for us to line up with the the plan that God has. And so there's this interruption moment where the crowds gather. It, 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 It contradicts the plan of rest. But Jesus looks on the crowd and he says, I have to do what the Father sent me to do. In fact, John chapter 5, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, the Son, which he's referring to himself, can do nothing on his own. He does only what he sees his Father doing. For the Father loves the Son and shows him what he does. Jesus saw the crowds and he recognized a divine appointment. The rest was still coming. 
There would be rest in a little while, but there was work to be done here. There was love to be expressed. There was, there was needs to be met. After all, it's why Jesus came. Didn't he say, I'm here to establish my father's kingdom? And there's these 5,000, the Bible says, just men alone. And so the winds of, of, of their schedule had shifted. The, the plans had changed and the crowd showed up. And there's new direction for the moment. And because of Jesus' obedience, 5,000 people are fed they were exposed to the bread of life. And in Mark chapter 6, later, he speaks to those same crowd of people and he tells them, don't you know the bread just feeds you for a moment, but I am the bread of life? Jesus wasn't just feeding them physically. He was showing them the provision of the Lord by, by giving the miracle. And not only did he minister to the people, but the disciples. It was a teaching moment for the disciples. The disciples watched Jesus bring the provision from heaven. And the disciples, were they were just tired. And they were like, oh, Jesus. He says, all we have is these five loaves and two fish. That's it. It's five loaves, two fish. He said, all we have is this lunch. And what did Jesus say? He said, you feed them. Here. He prayed over it, broke it, and provided it. How many baskets were left over? Twelve. One for each of them. There's a lesson that's learned by the disciples. These people were fed. They were ministered to. And on top of that, the story is recorded for countless generations to hear about the provision of God and the bread of life. How many of you know that was an important divine appointment? That was an important interruption. But the disciples, you know what their response was? Send them away, Jesus. <laughs> When Jesus said, began to teach them, the, the disciples came in Mark 6, it says this. He said, send them away. And, and he, they said, send them so they can get food to eat. You know what? They made it look like we're, we're concerned for them because they're, they're hungry. Guess whose stomach was really rumbling? It was the disciples. They said, Jesus, they're going to be hungry. There's no food here. Send them home to buy food. And they're, they're, they're missing the entire opportunity here. And Jesus looked at them and said, you give them something to eat. And because, listen to this, he, we can miss the agenda of God when we are overly focused on our plans. Someone say amen. I want you to think about this the next time you're interrupted. Psalm 37 says this, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. That delay in your life might be a life building lesson for you. That irritating person that you can't keep encountering might be sandpaper that God is using to sand off some of the rough edges of your own life. That interruption could be a moment for God's glory to shine. That need or struggle in your life that you're facing and you're up against could be the opportunity for God to reveal himself in a new way to you. Interruptions are, are sometimes on God's agenda. Sometimes we're like the disciples and we miss them and, and and sometimes the worst thing that can happen to us is that everything comes easy. There's no struggle. There's no, there's no journey. There's no challenges. There's no delay. There's no irritating person. How many of you know those are the opportunities that God uses to grow? You see, Jesus responded appropriately to the interruption, but the disciples, they just complained. They just said, Jesus, we're tired. We don't want to do this anymore. Did you know that God has an agenda and a plan? Let's make this personal for a second. It's easy to look at the disciples. They missed it. But did you know God has plans for your life? Here's an insight for you. I, I can't wait to tell the graduates second service when they're in, in here. Did you know you're not put here on this earth just for you? Part of God's agenda and plan is not just for your comfort every day. It's not just for your plans to succeed. It's not just for your career to work out. How many of you know at your job, some of you are placed in your job to help others out, not just earn a living? God strategically placed you not only to make money for your household, to be, but God's placed you somewhere where they need the light shined. Someone say amen. God has an agenda. He has a plan, and you're not put here. It's right up there on our walls, purpose. It's one of our core values. Each one of us has a purpose in our life. And when we become obsessed with our agenda, listen to me. If our careers and our future plans and our grades or, or, or what other people think about us or, or how our relationships are going or our comfort and excitement, if those things consume our hearts and minds, we will oftentimes miss God's agenda. So often we ask God to come into our plans instead of us submitting ourselves to the Lord for his plans. 
real quickly before I move to the second point, I just want to highlight, listen to God's plan and agenda. God's plan and agenda will always prioritize some things over other. And we struggle with this a little bit because all we see is the circumstance. We see the interruption. We see I'm going toward that and this is getting in the way. But I want you to see the bigger picture for a moment. God's plan will always prioritize eternal things over temporary. God has in mind not the things of man. He has in mind your character growth. He has in mind ministry. He has in mind souls, people's eternal destiny. He has eternity in mind. God's uh, God's plan will always prioritize people over prophets and things. People are important to the heart of God. He's always going to prioritize when that person who annoys you or interrupts you or comes into your path. Listen, God is more concerned with people than he is that, that to-do list thing you got to go check off. His purposes and plans involve the eternal. It involves people. Listen, he's always going to prioritize his redemptive work. Did you know God has a redemptive work he's doing in our lives? And the struggle and the pain and some of those things are about healing, about growing. Let me give you an example. Romans 8 says this. It says, for those who are called according to his purpose, God works all things together for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose, he works what? Say all. Come on, say all. He works all things for good. Do you know what that means? That means God's plan is always growing you. So he prioritizes your growth over your comfort. He, he, he prioritizes your healing over just numbing the pain so you don't feel bad anymore. You see, God wants you whole. He wants you healed. He wants you growing. He's not just concerned with your comfort or that you don't have pain or struggle or heartache. He wants you to become, not just do. You see how his redemptive work and his, is in his plan all the time? Sometimes we walk around just focused on our, our plan and our agenda, and we see everything as interruptions and obstacles. And if we see everything as interruption and obstacles, we will miss so many divine appointments. Isn't God good? He uses every struggle, every heartache, every relationship challenge as an opportunity for him to work and to build God's character in you. Come on, someone say amen. God's a good God. His plans are good. Can I leave you with just one thought on that first point? And he told his people, the children of Israel, he said, my plans, I know the plans I have for you. Their thoughts, their plans of a hope and a future. To prosper you and not to harm you. Church, if we line ourselves up with God's plan, we're going to face a lot of challenges. In this world, you will have heartache. You will have trouble. He said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And when you find yourself up with God's plan, listen, good things happen. So number one, we've got to learn to line ourselves up with God's plan. Can't be like the disciples and miss the moment entirely. But the second thing is this. I believe we not only need to know God's plan, we need to find out what pleases God. We, we need to find out not just what's your agenda, God. If we're, if we're not careful, if we just look for God's agenda, we're like, okay, God, I know what you want. And we'll run out and we'll try to do his will without getting his heart behind it. Listen, I believe that we need to find God's heart behind the matter. You see, prior to the storm, the disciples not only missed the appointment on the agenda that God had with the feeding of the 5,000, they missed the heart of God entirely. They didn't just miss the appointment or the agenda, they missed the heart. Because here's what the words of Mark, he records in the storm. When Jesus climbs into the boat, he gets in with them, the wind immediately dies down, and they were completely amazed. Listen to the phrase that Paul adds here, I mean, not Paul, uh, that Mark adds here. They were completely amazed. Jesus gets in the boat, he, the storm calms, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Now, I wrestled with that as I read through it. I was like, why, why is that the connection to why they were amazed? Because their hearts were hardened and they, they didn't understand the loaves. What was going on here? That, that word amazed was like they were just kind of baffled. They're like, what's going on? Listen, it wasn't because Jesus calmed the waves. Jesus had just calmed the storm two chapters earlier in Mark chapter 4 when they were on the boat and it was going crazy and he was asleep down on the boat. Do you, do you remember that story? And they, call, they cried out to him because you have little faith. He says, peace be still. And then and all of a sudden the waves, they had seen him do that specific miracle. 
They had just seen him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. That's, he, they weren't amazed that he was walking on water or that he calmed the storms. That, that's not why they were amazed. In fact, in Mark chapter 5, he had just raised a dead girl to life. So why were they amazed when Jesus steps in the boat? And Mark makes a point here to say they were amazed, they were baffled, they were bewildered because, because uh, their hearts were hardened about the bread. Do you know what's going on here in the disciples? Is that They're looking at Jesus going, what's going on here, Jesus? You sent us to go over for rest, right? You are the one who sent us ahead and said, get out there in the storm. You're the one that tells us to go out. These are your plans. And here's the boat. We're out struggling. It says late in the night he saw them and early in the morning. So probably around 3 or 4 a.m. So they were out there for hours straining at the boat. And do you know what Mark records? Jesus is walking on the water and he's about to pass them by. So they're sitting in the boat and they're like, Jesus, where are you going? We're doing your work here. We're following the schedule. What, where are you going, Jesus? They see him passing by, and at first they think he's a ghost, and then they're like, Jesus. Listen, they were amazed when he stepped in the boat because they're like, Jesus, what are you doing? Where are you going? We don't understand. Have you ever felt like, I'm doing all the right things, God. Why are things going wrong for me? Has anyone ever felt that before? Like, I'm here doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. Mark records this because at the time their hearts were hard. Mark's recognizing they didn't see it. They missed the whole point. So they just thought they were going over for rest and relaxation. They get there, the crowds are there, and they're grumbling. They're like, Jesus. And Jesus says, you feed them. So fine. They feed the 5,000. And then he says, now go back to the other side. They're, okay, finally, rest. In their mind, they're just transitioning from one side of the lake to the other. And then they face this wall of wind that shuts them down. They're straining at the oars, the Bible says, for hours. And then Jesus comes and is going to walk by them. How many of you have ever felt like, God, I wish you'd show up. I wish you'd like, do you see what's going on here? Like, Jesus, do you know what's, what's happening? You, you look at your family member or friend and their behavior and you're like, God, do you? How many of you, if you were like God, you'd have a zapper button and you'd just zap people and you'd be like, let me fix this, God, I got it. Bzz. Sometimes we're in our, our own perspective, and so we see life our way. And here's the thing. If we don't see God's agenda, it's often because we don't have God's heart. And if we don't have God's heart, we can't see the bigger picture or the things that are really important in life. So we're going about our business, we're doing our thing, and then we're crossing over. Jesus is the one who sent me. I'm crossing over the lake, and the storm goes crazy, and Jesus is like just, he's just skipping on the water over by himself going to the other side. Hello, Jesus. The word there is not just amazed. It's, it's like baffled. It's confused. It's like, what's, what's going on? What did we miss here? And Mark puts it in a little parenthetical phrase so that we would know what they missed. Their hearts were hard about the loaves. See, they didn't see the priority of heaven. They missed it. When Jesus uh, told them, you feed them, that was Jesus' response to say, you're missing the divine appointment. You're not, letting the inter you're not letting the agenda of God supersede the agenda of man or our purpose or our will. So you're, you're missing the whole point. So he goes, here, you feed them. And then he uses them to perform the miracle. He says, you hand it out. He prayed, broke over the bread, gave it to the disciples. And on top of that, they had all this leftover food. God, Jesus was showing them, and they didn't get the lesson. So you know what he did? He, the Bible says immediately, if you read the beginning of the chapter or the beginning of that passage again, it says immediately he sent them away to go to the other side and he went alone to pray. You know what I think? I, Jesus was like, you know what? Go learn this lesson on your own. You didn't want to follow the agenda. I have a whole other agenda item. You need to learn a lesson. Go, go get in the boat and just head over there. I think Jesus knew they were headed for some type of storm. I think Jesus knew and he went away to be with the Father. And so he's like, okay, you don't want to learn the lesson here. I got another lesson you're going to learn over there. Go ahead and head that way. And here's what I want you to know about God's heart. It's always for people. The Bible says Jesus saw a, a, the crowd and he saw sheep without a shepherd. I don't know if you know much about sheep, but sheep can't really defend themselves. They don't have a lot of defensive ability or qualities about their life. They have to be led everywhere. They're gentle things. They're naive things. And so when it says they were sheep without a shepherd, Jesus' heart had compassion. The Bible says had compassion on the people. 
And when the disciples missed the compassion, they missed the heart of God, the, 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 the moment was, was gone. They just went about their business on to the next thing. And Jesus says, no, you need to learn something here. And so he says, if you're not getting it, just head out on your own. Face the storm in your own strength, your own skill, your own ability. See how things are. If you're going to do life on your agenda, just go ahead and head out there and see, see what kind of things you face when you're the one that's in charge. And I'll be over here praying, talking to my father. His, his desire was for them to get it. Jesus wanted them to understand. I think that's why he led them in, uh, into the storm and into the challenging part because he saw the sheep without a shepherd and they didn't notice they didn't see the heart of compassion uh, for the people so he said uh, let me let this experience happen to you so that when I come and step in you'll you'll see that my agenda is to follow the father my my plans are different than yours and and so here's what we need to understand that I think Jesus understood finding the agenda of God is about submitting your plans or your schedule but finding the heart of God or what pleases God is about intimacy with him. You see, Jesus, while they were out to learn their lesson, Jesus went to spend time with the Father. Jesus went up to the mountain to be with his heavenly Father. Do you know why Jesus didn't miss the moments? Because Jesus was in line with the heart of the Father. You see, when the interruption came, he was just as much wanting the rest, but the difference was not only did he submit to God's will, he also knew that the heart of the Father was people over moments or things. And so when he saw this, he had compassion because he knew the what? Say heart. He knew the heart of the Father. You see, we're able to submit ourselves. I, I actually want to go a step further. I want to tell you that we, it, is, it is very hard. I want to almost say impossible. It would be impossible for us to truly follow all of the plans of God and the agenda of God if we never understand the heart of God. Some things it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's like, but God, I can't forgive that person or I can't let that go because it's got to get fixed. It's got to get right. And, and we would step into our logic mind that says, no, God, you're a just God and this needs to be just. It needs to be fixed. But if we don't ever understand the heart of God, we won't ever. Did you know the Bible says God desires mercy over judgment? His heart is for people. Someone say, that's me. Come on, say, that's me. You're a people that God is concerned with. You're a person who the heart of God leans toward. And we'll miss the agenda of God or the plan of God if we don't ever understand the heart of God. And the agenda of God can be found when we just submit and we seek him. He'll lead us. The steps of a righteous are ordered to the Lord. He'll lead us to those moments. But we'll only follow and submit if we know the heart of God. And where is that found? It's found with intimacy with God. It's found through prayer. It's found when we read his word and we understand what is important to God and the heart of the Lord. It's found when we talk to God and we, we spend time with him. It's found when we seek him. Did you know that we can actively seek God? Do you know that we can look for and say, God, reveal your heart to me? Some of us think that God's heart is unknowable or his plans are unknowable, but I, I wanna, I'm here to propose to you today, this entire scripture that God left as the Bible for us was to say this is an invitation to get to know me and my plan and my heart. God wants us to know his heart. He wants us to be intimate with him. In fact, if you look at David in the story, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. David understood things that didn't make sense logically at the time. In fact, when he goes and sins and commits murder and adultery, David, unlike, unlike uh, the others around him who, who read the law and know what should happen, David went before the Lord and wept and repented. When Nathan confronted him, there was a heart issue because David understood the heart of God. God wants us to seek him. He wants us to look for his will. And so this morning, it's important for us to find God's plan or agenda for our life because he wants us to know that. But it's important for us to find out what pleases God. Search for his heart. Look for him. He says, those who seek me will find me, who seek me with all their heart. There's a desire on God's part to know, for, for us to know him, for us to be close to him. The intimacy of Jesus is what allowed him to not miss the moments that God had sent his way. So first, we need to find the plans of God. We need to know the agenda of God. But secondly, we need to find out what pleases God. 
Okay, if we want to be successful in life, we need to submit our plans and let his agenda rule, but we also need to seek his heart. And, and the third thing that I want to say that I think we can learn is that we need God's grace in our life. Say grace. The disciples were in that storm, much of their own doing. <laughs> They were sent there by Jesus, I think, knowing that they were going to learn this lesson. But they were straining. They hit a wall. They hit a stuck place that, that baffled them. And when Jesus went by, it was like, this is confusing to me. What is going on? And, and, and here's the thing I want you to understand. Jesus didn't just leave them. He stepped into the boat. Aren't you glad Jesus steps into the boat? <laughs> There's moments where Jesus looks at his disciples, and I think he just probably, uh, I don't know about you, Pastor, but when I read some of the disciples' things, it, I, I think Jesus sometimes just looked at them and like, just, oh, no, God, please just, just deliver me from these guys. I mean, when he, he looks at Peter, and he's like, get behind me, Satan. Like, you have the things of man in mind. I think sometimes he's just like, you just don't get it. I, surely he had to have been fed up sometimes. But despite all of it, Jesus, as he's walking by, he intended to pass them by. Until they cried out. He was waiting for them to be willing to receive what, what they needed from him and the guidance. And when they cried out, what does he do? He comes to them. Aren't you glad when we cry out, he's there? It doesn't matter that we messed up one time or two times or three times or ten times. When we cry out to the Lord, how many of you are grateful he comes to the boat and he says, I'm here? Come on, give God praise for that. That's a stopping moment to thank him for that. The disciples had seen him calm the waves. In, in Mark chapter 4, the storm was so great, they feared for their life. It doesn't say that in Mark chapter 6. It just, they were just, they were worn out. They were exhausted. They were straining. But Mark chapter 4, the story where the boat was tossing, they were fishermen, and they thought they were going to lose their life. And they went down to Jesus in the bottom, and they're like, Jesus, rescue us. And here's the words he said. And I, and I think that transfers into the same moment. When Jesus steps in, he, he's the one that controls the winds and the waves. He said, peace. Be still. And, and in, the, in the original language, it's siapo, peace, meaning be silent, to hold your peace. And it means be still, to like close the mouth with a muzzle. Do you have any, any of your kids go like this, go, Ch -ch -ch. Do, they ever, do you have any of your kids do that to you? Or do you do that to your kids? Like, Ch -ch. That's what comes to my mind. But God, when, he, when Jesus spoke to the winds, he just said, silence, be still. And when he stepped into the boat, the Bible says the winds just calmed. And there, there was a peace that came over that moment. That's what God's grace looks like. In the middle of the chaos of our life, in the middle of the circumstance that oftentimes our own sin created, the hurricane or tornado of things that we contributed to and that this world is a part of is coming against our life. And grace is called unmerited favor, undeserved favor from God. We cry out, we need help. We probably deserve what we should get or if we should get what we deserve. But he steps into the boat and he says, peace, be still. And he silences the chaos around us. He silences the accusations against us. He silences the circumstances. And he says, I am with you. How many of you know the disciples had a lot more learning to do? They had a lot more struggles that they faced. But how many of you know with Jesus in their boat, they were able to do all that God had called them to do? I want you to know this morning, if the graduates were here, I'd be telling them about their future. But I, I want to tell you as, as adults, as married couples, as empty nesters, as all phases of life, I want you to know that when Jesus steps in, a peace can come that allows us to know his heart and learn his plan the way he wants us to. How many of you know that it's up to us to submit ourselves to God? It's up to us to cry out to him. It's up to us to say, Jesus, I need your help. It's up to us to say, God, I, I, I don't know why you're walking by in this moment. I don't know why I can't get you here where I need you. I don't know why I'm confused, but I'm going to put all that aside. And I'm going to cry out to you. I need you in my life. How many of you know that is up to us? I want to pray with you this morning. And you might be in a couple categories. You may be in a category where you've never surrendered your life to God where you've been on your own path and you've been like coordinating your life and you've just asked God to like be a part of it, but you've never surrendered your life to God. If that's you, I wanna pray with you today to surrender your heart to the Lord. Say, God, I'm putting my life, my plans I put on hold, my plans for my future, I'm leaving them behind. I want your plan for my life.
Some of you might be in a category where you've surrendered your life to God, but you, you need the wisdom and the direction for God. Maybe like the disciples, you're like, Jesus, I've done everything. I, I'm, I'm just going from one place to another, and here I am hitting storms and winds, and I don't know what to do with this. How many of you know that we need, we need his wisdom? We need his guidance. We need him to speak to those places where our hearts are hard. Because I didn't share this scripture to you, but I want to tell you that Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you, this is God speaking to his people, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. God is able to even, even heal the heart, even, even turn the heart of stone into flesh. And so when we need guidance from the Lord, it's like this. God, I don't even know what's going on. I don't know why you're passing me by, but I know you're able to work in my life. I need your wisdom and I need your direction. How many of you are a candidate for that this morning? <laughs> and you might be in a third category of people who just need to be able to let, receive God's grace. You, you might need to have him come in and step in and calm the storm and the chaos and say, you know what, I'm going to bring a grace, undeserved, unmerited, so that you can even begin to seek the Father. How many of you know that without sin out of the way, without our struggles, without what Christ did on the cross, we could not con commit our lives to God? We couldn't walk in righteousness. We couldn't even allow his presence to lead us because with our own sinful heart, until Jesus steps in and brings grace, we're not able to move forward.